Hi, I'm Mark Rosano, founder and CEO of C6 Capital Holdings, coming to you from Primer Vision Network. So this week, we had a busy week. We had the EIA show, which was a little bit long because we were covering OPEC, and then we threw in an extra episode looking more specifically at food and geopolitics and how things are starting to shift and how food is really starting to become, or I should say, continuing to be a, a big overhang. So now that we, uh, we've covered that, we'll, we'll have a little bit more on inflation, but just because of the, uh, some of the additional data that's come out, especially on the um, University of Michigan uh, updates. But more importantly, it's obviously our favorite day, the primary vision frack spread count. So the frack spread count came in plus three. So we went from 266 to 269. Uh, Permian was was flat. That That's something that we uh, we expected. We were talking about a much bigger uh, increase, which came last week. So that is kind of a big, uh, big increase and just, you know, that's relatively speaking. But we did get a little bit of a step up. But we had the bigger increases in the gas side, which I don't think is surprising given where gas is, where LNG is, and just what time of year we're heading into, which is going into winter. So we had an increase in Appala uh, Appalachia. Uh, we had it in the uh, in the Texas LA salt, and then obviously in Western Gulf. So everything else is, is kind of par for the course in terms of what we are expecting, where things are going, and we're still on track to hit our magic number of 275. So there's not too much to uh, to continue to talk about there. You know, one of the big things that we've been uh, really talk, uh, looking at as we go into December is that we're just not gonna get the same type of decline that we normally get on a seasonal basis. Because if you remember, there's typically a fairly sizable drop between Thanksgiving and Christmas, really this kind of six week period and now what we will see a reduction, it just won't be to the same degree because we're just not, we're not starting at the same type of level. And the other thing that's interesting is on the dual stem or simul frac, whichever uh, you know, nomenclature you use, we're starting to see a little bit more interest as we start to branch out from the Permian because it's worked in the Permian. We've seen it work on a continuous basis and we're starting to get some uh, hearing that it, it's, it's really starting to increase in some other areas or at least get talked about, or is the equipment available? Can we get the prop in? Can we get the chemicals? Can we get the fluid? You know, all of those things come into it. So it may, it, you may say, oh, well, there's four wells on that pad, so it can clearly be done. It's like, well, that's just one piece of that pie. And, and there's other uh, things that are starting to get talked about and work through to see that get uh, deployed in other regions. Now, on the other side, when we look at, you know, going into 2022, where is the, where are the ducks going to be? Where's activity going to be? And here you can see that there was a net increase of six total rigs in the U.S., uh, four in oil, uh, two in gas. But when we look at directional versus horizontal, so we had seven horizontal uh, in, uh, increasing, two directional, but three vertical coming down. So again, we're still seeing the increase. We're still seeing the infra, uh, the, the the push to refill that the duck count, the, uh, you know, start to really, and again, not so much just add back all of these ducks, but just to stop the decline. Because when we start going into Q1, Q2, we expect to see some acceleration again of activity from the frack spread count side, and you need places to go. You need uh, ducks to complete. So we're, we're, we just expect this to continue, and we don't we don't expect to see the decline in rig count that we do in uh, in spreads, just because this is going to be that that key period where they can make up some room, especially some breathing room in December as we get into January. But those are things that we're going to talk about a bit more next week and the week after as we start to see what those plans are going to look like as we um, as we head into not only just December but also Q1. Now, one of the things that we had talked about uh, in, in yesterday's show on the geopolitical and food show was about Belarus. So just to give a little bit of an update, uh, two uh, Russian paratroopers have been killed in Belarus. Uh, they, it looks like it was a uh, training accident, but again, just more stress to the situation, just more issues that have, that have arisen. 
NATO has um, has asked Belarus to stop, uh, and that uh, you know cease and desist with some of their um, their movements. When you look at what Poland has done, Poland has sent a, a, there's about twelve thousand troops uh, and could potentially reach up to fourteen thousand troops uh, right around the um, the Polish and Belarus border. But a lot of these uh, a lot of these activities that Belarus has done has also been done in Lithuania, Poland, and obviously Ukraine. So there's a lot of uh, strife here. But this is just a chart looking at why should we care. And it just is showing the pipelines that go from Russia in through Belarus into Poland, into Ukraine, into Lithuania, and there is risk. Now, given Belarus is would will not do anything to anger Russia. Russia and Belarus are very close. So it's not like they're gonna sit there and just turn off the gas unless Russia tells them to do it. They will not do that on its own right because then that would catch the the anger of Putin and others. So again, these are just, this is why it matters. This is why there is a lot of risk and why Russia could easily be using this as a means of putting additional pressure and to, to renegotiate some of their deals. There's still um, negotiations happening between Germany and Russia right now, so it's not like there's an all stop. There's still a lot of movement to figure out how we can get to the other to the other side. And, and obviously you know, Russia wants long-term contracts and they want them at fairly healthy prices. So again, there's there's gonna be some of this, this push, but this is more, from Russians per, uh, Russia's perspective, this is more saber rattling. We have them moving assets uh, closer to Ukraine, but remember, it, it's still muddy there. It, I don't think anything is going to happen. But if it if there was going to be something, it would be once everything freezes, because it's much easier to obviously move he- heavy machinery. But these I, right now, I think there's just a lot of trying to reposition trying to, to try to wake people up to where things sit, how things sit right now, where gas is, where gas comes from. And again, these are just movements to try to uh, get there uh, for Russia and Putin's to get their way. And Belarus is a, is a strong way to do that, just given how those two main pipelines cut right into Poland. And obviously Poland and Belarus is where we have the the biggest issue right now. It's happening in other areas, but that is where the largest contingent of soldiers on both sides that are only separated by 100, 200 yards and a chain link fence, which is where things can get uh, a little concerning. But now just providing some updates on, on inflation, just, you know, kind of rounding out the conversation that we had on Thursday. Here's where we look at what's happening with core CPI. You can see it's at 4.6%. But as we said uh, last month, we saw that reacceleration. And now you can, uh, uh, all but one target is uh, 50 basis points above target. So the Dallas trimmed mean PCE is the last thing to be 50, uh, 50 basis points or more above that measure. Right now, it's only 25 to 50, which is why it's orange. But I can assure you, based on everything that's happening right here, it will be above. The biggest concern that we've seen so far is that big uh, increase in the sticky CPI, which is what we were saying uh, last month was that the CPI that we're seeing is going to pull that higher and you're going to see that that reaccelerate into October. Now it'll start to level off in in November, but it's not going down. And that's the biggest issue that we're seeing. It's just the pace of increases will slow but not go away. And this is just kind of showing that to a bigger degree. And this is just showing the monthly uh, percent change of aver- average hourly earnings minus CPI. So you're looking at just where we are on the month, and you can see that inflation continues to outpace that uh, hourly earnings, which is the underlying problem, because even though we're getting increases in earnings, we're not getting the buying power in earnings because it's not me- re- it's not catching up or keeping pace with inflation. And this just breaks down where those wages are. And again, the first quartile or the lowest, or the, the really the lowest 25% continue to see their, their uh, wages go up, but it's still not enough to keep up with where living expenses are while the fourth quartile and the third quartile continue to weaken. Fourth quartile being the top 25%, and then the, um, the third quartile being the, the second highest uh, 25%. You can see just where they sit and how they're seeing that everything continue to get worse when you're looking at wages. And we're going to talk about productivity at the end of this because productivity has been hit. When you look at productivity, it's been, it's taken a big uh, move to the downside, 
by almost 5%. And is it happening now because we're in this position where you're not hiring people with more experience, which would cost more money. Instead, you're hiring people with less experience and you're hiring more of them, which you're paying them a bit more, but you're still trying to save money. And that's resulting in a weakness on the um, productivity side. Now, when you when we kind of back all this in to show the share of total spending on food, gasoline, and utilities, it's not surprising that the lowest quartile or the first quart- quartile spends the most of their of their wages. Which is why when you look at where wages are going, their wages are going up the most, and they're going to be passing that along to the energy and food side. And as we've been talking about what seems like endlessly, food is not turning around, and now we have fertilizers making a new all-time high in the U.S., and it's happening elsewhere, so you're going to continue to see those food prices remain elevated. And then this just puts into perspective because there's been a lot of talk about where is energy, you know, if energy prices fall, well, what is that going to do? Well, where's reopening? Well, non-reopening components make up 78% of the CPI calculation, which is why we've been talking about the stickiness of The sticky CPI is the one that was going to get pulled up, and that's the one that now has momentum. We've seen the um, the reopening uh, side start to slow down a bit. That's starting to 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 not be the same type of driver. While energy is obviously still there, still big, but the non reopening component, the sticky component, is only expanding. And when we look at rents, when we look at housing, when we look at wages, when we look at prices in general, as we talked about in Thursday's show. All of that is going to trend higher, keeping that bid beneath inflation. And this is just putting into perspective as we've been talking about. And I just, I love the flexible CPI currently at 15.8% to give you an idea of, you know, but again, that can swing, that that can dance where the sticky CPI, but the flexible one, even though it can move, uh, some of that is getting baked further and further into the, into the sticky and now that that cat is out of the bag, we expect that to continue to get pulled higher and see that sticky continue to trend closer to 3.5, 3.7% as we, as we progress through November. And here's just showing you where fertilizer sits right now. We are currently at a new all-time high for North American fertilizer prices. For, for those that, that missed it, um, China is now cutting their urea ex- exports which has sent India and South Korea scrambling. So again, you're just seeing more pressure, more pricing, and all of this is going to get baked into what are crop prices going to look like in 2022. And just when you look at what some of the pain is, and and if you go back to where we were in 2010, 2011, the last time grain prices went to where they are versus where they are today and where fertilizer prices are, the input costs are going up as yields continue to struggle on a global basis. Again, putting this pressure, not only just on the, on the, the, the local consumer, but the international consumer, the emerging market. And this is all, uh, again, the big driver of inflation. Now, we did get the University of Chicago coming out today uh, and, and providing some information. So it's, it's a little frightening that when asked what is worse, the beginning of COVID or this, uh, people said this. And uh, when you look at current economic conditions, it is, at a, uh, it is at essentially a 2011 low. So things are essentially worse than they were when COVID started, according to this metric, which again is just where do people expect their financial situation to be? Where do they expect wages to go? What do they expect their uh, their costs to be going forward? And these are all the things that we did cover in the econ show yesterday in segments uh, two and three. So then when we look at where where are some of the price pressures the, the biggest, and you can see just where they are, which is not coastal, which I, I think for some might be surprising, but if you consider about where prices are on the coast, it makes a little bit more sense because they're, they've always been, the cost of living's always been higher. So maybe it's just on a percentage level, it's not as great just because costs were already starting higher. So costs going up, you have the, you know, you have that, that backdrop, but you also have shipment. And what do we know about shipping? What do we know about rail? What do we know about trucking? It's really expensive right now. And you have to ship and truck from the coast inward. But you also had prices that were normally lower. Living expenses were typically reduced in these, um, these middle states or for some, as some might call, some flyover states. 
So that's where you can also get some of this makeup. But again, just increasing the cost for all Americans. And you can just see the size in which they're getting hit. Now, living costs are still going to be cheaper in Kansas versus New York, but it's just the percentage move is that much greater in Kansas, in Colorado, Utah, Nevada versus California in New York. And this is just honing in a bit more on the consumer sentiment, you know, so you can see just how low it is, just trying to separate it out and, and not going back to 2000, but going back just to 2007. You can see that we're right back to these 2011 levels and people are, and, and we had two times during COVID to break those levels, but here we are. Given the government stepped in, the Fed stepped in, so there was a certain amount of comfort that helped alleviate some of those fears, but now... The government's, you know, we, we're reaching fiscal drag. We have, you know, tapering coming in. We have raising rates. Uh, again, a lot of these things are starting to, uh, to, to become very, you know, felt through. And when you look at supply chains, when you look at things, how they're, they, you know, as, as I've been saying since the beginning of this year, this wasn't going to be fixed by November, December of 2021. This is a 2022 event or fix by Q3, hopefully at the earliest. But again, I, I, we're still not seeing any uh, indications that that is the case. And then this is just looking about the difference between CPI and PPI year over year. And we haven't had something this low since the 74 and 75. And the other thing that I think is important to, to consider, when you look at the 70s, the 70s and 80s, and, 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 it, and I know it's, it's something that you know, we're not really comfortable with because a lot of us may, you know, may, may not remember it because we weren't, we weren't born yet or we were too young to care. But when you had savings in the bank and, and you had a money market account, you had a savings account, Yes, inflation was 14, 15%. But your savings account was making you 8, 10, 11%. You're not getting that right now. Right now, you're sitting there, we're staring down what, and if you take this into, into there, uh, before Volcker changed it, we're at 14%. But let's just say, let's just take what we know, uh, you know inflation to be at 6%. So inflation is at 6% and you're earning 0.05%. You're earning five basis points. Well, technically you were better off in the 80s when inflation was higher because you were, st you, you were still capturing something and so the delta wasn't as wide. Here you have to be invested in stocks. You have to be invested in crypto and commodities to try to make any sort of, of recovery because your savings account is utterly useless and is growing at a negative rate once you factor in inflation, which I think is the biggest problem when you compare where we are now versus where we were in the 70s and 80s. And that's something that I think is going to continue to reverberate through the system. And now when we look at the uh, labor uh, productivity, you get an idea of the huge drop in productivity. And it was sizable by 5%. It's the worst drop we've had. And there's a lot behind that. You had supply chain issues. You had new hires. And remember, you're hiring people that may not be as skilled at, as what you would normally, but you're desperate. You need work. So there's a training side. There's going to be a period where you ha it takes to bring them in, to bring them up to speed. So again, we do expect this to close some of that gap, but this is also a drag because then there's going to be more slack in the system. There's going to be more pressure. And again, that's just going to lead to additional supply chain issues, additional inventory problems, wholesale problems. And I, there's just a continuation of, of a mirror of problems that, that sit out there like little landmines. Now, when people care, I don't know. The University of Michigan data came out and we rallied 30 handles. So clearly nobody cares right now. But all of these things lead to rising inflation, um, rising costs, falling real wages, and that doesn't equal growth. And again, these are the things that we've been looking at, trying to stay, keep our, our pulse on. And again, these are all, then the reason why we talk about this with energy is because Energy is labor intensive. It has, it has steel, diesel, all of these raw materials and inputs continue to go up, which is just going to keep the price of activity. Even though the price of crude is elevated, the cost of doing business is going up. Again, keeping pressure on those margins. So if you have any questions, you know, you know where to find us. You know, we always love uh, chatting on Twitter, on uh, in the comments section. So 
Hopefully you have a, a great weekend. And for those, you know, uh, that served, we hope you had a, a great Veterans Day and, uh, and can enjoy some, some uh, prolonged festivities this weekend. So thanks again for watching. I'm Mark Crisano, founder and CEO of C6 Capital Holdings, coming to you from Prime Vision Network.